And then, so as we start to talk about the need for solution, the, the one crisis that, that you hear about first is, is health, and the second one you hear about uh, is climate change and, and the amount of carbon we're putting into our atmosphere. And even if you don't believe in climate change, certainly putting all that pollution into our atmosphere is not a good thing for, for us or for the planet. Um, I do worry as I speak about this in, in um, you know, more conservative parts of the country. Um, I saw this bumper sticker in Vermont. So, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not here necessarily as, a, as an environmentalist, but I do personally, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say I believe. It is, it is patently clear to any scientist that deserves, um, you know, certification that we are causing global warming and it is a problem. Uh, and we know the outcomes of that over time. Uh, and this is my old neighborhood of Miami Beach and my house is somewhere in the blue area. When the oceans rise five feet, that's going to be our, our, our landscape. And of course, more to the point and more immediately is the, 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 our, what we're already seeing is the generation of greater storm activity. Um, I had the, the displeasure of visiting uh, Mississippi and, and, um, and New Orleans after Katrina and, and witnessing that with, with a bunch of mayors. Uh, and if we are going to do something about re limiting, as we, do, as we work to limit the amount of, of pollutants that we put in the atmosphere, there's a couple really interesting facts. One is that independent of automobile use, you can see here in this USA Today, actually no, New York Times chart, um, that a single family house is generating twice as much greenhouse gases as an apartment in a multifamily unit. Think about it, when your apartment leaks air conditioning, you're essentially cooling your neighbor. Um, but in the middle of the countryside, you're cooling, you're cooling just the air around your house. So there's an efficiency to density um, that's, a, that's an important thing to think about as we try to reduce our footprint. But then if you look at the CO2 per household from automobile use, it's really funny. People used to think, environmentalists used to think that the cities were the evil thing because the, the, the CO2 per square mile, of course, was higher in the cities than it was in the country. But then someone had the bright idea of saying, you know, let's look at it per person or per household. And what happens when you flip it to per household, this happens to be, this happens to be Houston. But if you go to the website for CNT, I think it's cnt.org, Center for Neighborhood Technology, you find um, that every city has a map like this, where if you're in the center city or even in these wonderful uh, inner ring suburbs, uh, like I've heard of one called Midtown, for example, um, if you're in one of these inner ring suburbs, you're actually generating one quarter, typically, the amount of CO2 from auto use than if you're in an outer ring suburb. So that's a huge thing, and it, it actually has a greater impact than your house. The, the greatest way that you know, transportation is only a part of our contribution to, to climate change, but for the typical American, that's the, the way that we contribute personally the most is, is by driving around. And so if you can find a way to have one less car per family, actually the, the, the pleasure of living in a place where you can walk to stuff, that's how you, that, that has, actually the studies show that has 50 times the impact of changing all your light bulbs. So please do change all your light bulbs to the energy savers, but if you really want to have a, an, an impact that makes that one statistically insignificant, then try and live with one, one fewer car. Uh, and here's the, here's the great map that advocates for density. It shows how in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Chicago, um, as the households per acre increase, the vehicle, vehicle miles traveled drops off very quickly. What's interesting is that between, you know, even 10 units per acre, which is a nice row house density, um, and, you know, 200 units per acre, it's not that much of a difference because that's when you get into walkability. It's really the, the change from 10 units per acre to one unit per five acres, for example, where the big impact occurs. And so we don't need necessarily, and this, what this map tells us is we don't need super dense cities to accomplish this. We just need nice, nice urbanism. If, if you have single family houses that lead to row houses that lead to a center that has apartments, then you're accomplishing a very, uh, you're reaching a very nice point in that chart. And that is the traditional American neighborhood. This is handled very well if you want to learn more about this. The book Green Metropolis that came out last year by David Owen um, makes a very compelling case and a surprising case about why Manhattan is the greenest community in the U.S. And if you look at the per capita contribution of each resident, it is. But the argument, the argument I would make is you don't have to go that far to have a profound impact. Um, and so the, solu the, you know, the alternatives to driving everywhere living at densities and living in a neighborhood organization where transit works again um, and where biking works. And what we're learning as we look at American cities and not just New York, um, 
is that the introduction of bicycle facilities is pulling all these bikers out of the woodwork. In New York, in one year, they increased the amount of biking by 35%, just in one year, by doing this, by, by putting bike, bike paths in, bike lanes, and making it clear that bikers were welcome. And I tell cities, because often my client in a city is the city, say, and I say you're competing for millennials and for young people for whom car ownership isn't the cool thing it once was. Biking is definitely the cool thing to be doing. It isn't just that you want to make it possible for people to make this choice, but these green stripes in your streets are an advertisement that say, you know, young people are welcome here. You know, young, hip, innovative people uh, are wanted in this city um, because we're going to advocate for biking. And these are some pictures that my friends who live in Portland sent me. Um, and I asked them, I said, was this, was this bike to work day or what was this? They said, no, it was Tuesday. But this is just normal commuter, you know, bike crowding in cities like Portland. And frankly, in Washington, D.C., we've started to experience the same thing. Uh, and then ultimately, though, um, in terms of transportation, there's driving, transit, biking, always getting better. But what if we didn't have to move at all? And I was, I was going to write an article called Against Mobility until I saw that Lewis Mumford had written a similar article about, about 100, maybe 80 years ago, um, that we're mistaken. We're, we're, we're confusing means for ends when we think that the, the objective should be to move people around. The goal should be to create communities in which the least amount of motion accomplishes your daily needs. So this is our neighborhood. This is my wife when our first son was born walking around our neighborhood in Washington, D.C., where you have the apartments, uh, the shops, the grocery store, everything that you need close at hand. And of course, that's, it's a luxury. And frankly, in some cities, it's an expensive luxury to be able to live this way where mobility is less necessary. Um, so my point is that planning for health and planning for climate equals planning for walkability. And here in this final section of my talk, um, I'm just going to very quickly run through what I've come up with. And this is actually the basis for the next book, which I just got my contract on, uh, which is going to be called Walkable Cities. And it's about this the general theory of walkability I have that isn't mine alone, but I've developed it from working with a lot of different people. And finding people walking in areas where you wouldn't think they would and saying, what are the conditions that are causing this to happen? Um, so how do you get people to walk? And I would argue you need a reason to walk, a safe walk, a comfortable walk, and an interesting walk. All pretty straightforward, but it's useful to organize it in this way. A reason to walk has to do with the mixed use that we've already talked about. Jane Jacobs said, uh, no, one, no one will ever walk from sameness to sameness, even if the effort expended is minimal. And so the first job in our communities is to create things, to intermix things that you can walk to them from each other. So when looking at any place, and particularly looking at a downtown where walkability is most possible, look at the mix that you've got, like you have here on Broadway, and, and do the ratios. Say, what is missing or underrepresented? And then as a community, make a policy decision to try and bring in those things that you're missing and not, not try to bring in more of what you ha have a abundance of. Um, secondly, a safe walk has to do, frankly, these days less about crime and more about cars and about creating places where you feel, as a pedestrian, you at least have a fighting chance against the automobile. So as I've already said, many this is Alexandria. Millions of people come to Alexandria every year in Virginia. Um, only two streets are more than two lanes because they're small blocks. So there are small streets and lots of them. This is Coral Gables, Florida, but this idea of many small blocks. And any plan you see for any property that does not have blocks of a certain size, we can tell you the size in the Smart Growth Manual, but they shouldn't be much more than, than 250 by 600, then it's not going to be a walkable area. So number one, block size. Um, and we know this solution and what this produces. Um, that's, that's what that looks like. Um, fewer streets, unwalkable. And the sidewalk is there as a reminder of the planner's failure um, never occupied except if your engine, if your engine breaks. Um, and then the number of lanes, as I already discussed, and the width of those lanes. I was asked to do a walkability study for Oklahoma City, which had the honor of being named the least walkable city in America by Prevention Magazine. Um, and we've, we've completely reconfigured their downtown streets. They're building it now over the next three years. They're completely rebuilding their 140-acre downtown core because they have lots of money. They have a lot of oil and gas money. So they're spending their oil and gas money to make it more walkable in their downtown, which is lovely. Um, but the number of lanes and the width of those lanes, and you typically arrive in cities, this happens to be Davenport, Iowa, where my wife is from, and you have 13 and 14 foot travel lanes. A car is six feet wide. A 13 foot travel lane is a highway with travel lane. It sends the signal, 
go 70 miles an hour. A 10-foot lane is a typical urban lane that says, go urban speeds, go 25, go 30 miles an hour. So you take these 13 and 14-foot lanes, and wow, you know, now we have all this parking we didn't have before uh, because we've made the lanes the right size. Or let's add a median because we don't need this space and make the street more beautiful. This is, of course, accomplished for the cost of, of paint alone. So it's much cheaper than, than doing that. And both solutions are available to us. So here's a typical street in, in Davenport. The next step is one-ways. One-way streets, and I don't recall seeing too many here, um, but I, I'm ready to stand corrected. Most American cities in the 70s and 80s laid in a framework of one-way streets over what was a two-way system. And one-way streets, of course, because there's multiple lanes in the same direction, you know, whichever lane you're in, the other lane seems faster. So you get into this road ra racer mentality, whereas if you don't have the choice to occupy that other lane, you don't get into that frame of mind. So these are more dangerous from that way, there's, there, from that perspective. There's less potential for conflict from the other direction. So cars, again, are moving faster. And this huge mass of steel all moving in the same direction makes pedestrians feel less safe. Um, they're also bad for commerce because you can't see now half the stores that you're crossing, that you're passing when you go through an intersection. And most people whose cities have been converted to one way in the 80s or 70s, mostly the 70s, have stories about the stores that went out of business. Um, and then left-hand turn lanes, this is a state highway, unfortunately, because they, they set the rule in, in um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And these shops are all dead or dying because this left-hand turn lane, which is 300 feet long, is necessary to turn into a street with seven houses. It's not necessary, but the DOT decided it was. So the left-hand turn lane arrives, the parallel parking is removed, and the shops can't thrive. Um, so parallel parking is extremely important, both to serve shops, but also as a barrier of steel between the sidewalk and the street edge um, that makes the street feel safe, as are the street trees, which provide so many benefits, not to this fellow, um, <laughs> but they, they protect the sidewalk, they make pedestrians feel safer. And I'd like to take the opportunity here because so many cities, it's really hard to monetize the benefits that street trees provide. But if you could document and demonstrate all the things that street trees do, there's not a city in America that wouldn't be investing today in what I call a continuous canopy campaign to have streets everywhere, to have trees everywhere along every street and touching each other. Um, they absorb a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. They absorb a tremendous amount of rainwater so that they, they reduce your requirements for, um, for water treatment, which I know are, is very high in this part of the country. Um, they um, reduce heat island impacts uh, so that, so that you, you ha they, they actually lower neighborhoods that they're in, the temperatures, by about 8 to 10 degrees, uh, typically. And, and they increase real estate value, typically about $25,000 per home that they're placed in front of per tree. So there was a way, I guess that one can be achieved through tax, you know, if property values go up, those taxes do come back to the city. So there, there's, there's about 10 different ways that trees benefit. Uh, they make, they make a, a street under a tree, the, 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 the asphalt lasts about twice as long as a street that's exposed to sunlight. So there's all these things that trees do that, that cities need to put on the books in order to make decisions about how many trees to provide. But they also make, make cars typically go slower and make pedestrians feel safer. And there's this great thing that's hitting more and more cities across America, and you have a few streets that are potentially primed for these called the road diet. Who's heard this term, the, the road diet? Um, and the amazing thing about the road diet, I'll show you in a minute, but the, 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 um, the motivation is clear. These typical four-lane roads are extremely unsafe because you want to go left, the immediate car stops for you, and there's another car speeding in the next lane that T-bones you when you try to get across the intersection. And the statistics on these are very, are very bad. What if we were to make it one lane in each direction and have a center turn lane? So now there's no more opportunity for conflict. You notice there's room now for bike lanes, which is a nice thing, a nice thing to have in your streets. But the, 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 the impact on safety is dramatic. You know, one injury every 30 days versus one injury every nine days. This is a specific street in Orlando, Florida, but this experience is typical. But here's the shocker, the traffic capacity of the road is not, is not reduced at all. So if anyone here is proposing a road diet for any of your streets and someone from Public Works or anywhere else says you can't do it because we need the capacity, well, in fact, here are 25 different or 20 different streets 
And you can see, 1707 became 1607, you know, uh, 1700 became 1700, 2300 became 25900. It averages out pretty much identical before and after. So this is something you can do, you can do tomorrow. That's a safe walk. That's my longest category. Finishing up here, comfortable walk has to do with the fact that we humans are, are like all animals, we seek prospect and refuge. We want to be able to see our prey and our predators. We want to know that our back is covered. And so that's why the same you know, highway engineers that are widening your streets, when it comes time for their vacation, they go to places like Split in Croatia because they can hang out in these beautiful places which have edges. And a plaza is only as good as its edges, um, and a street is only as good as its street walls. And so these are the kind of spaces that, that draw us. We've been talking about it since the Renaissance. You know, what's the ideal width to height ratio? And what we've pretty much concluded is that beyond six to one, you don't feel comfortable. You don't feel enclosed anymore. If you don't feel enclosed, your, your you know, thousands of year old genes are telling you that you could be eaten. So we want to, we, we're drawn to places like Salzburg and Austria where we can experience this. And we're not drawn to places like Houston where you know, the, the, there is no spatial definition. Uh, and there's some great examples, for example, this bridge in the other Columbus that when they rebuilt it over a highway, they got people to walk between two neighborhoods they'd never walked between before because of that, that feeling of exposure to the highway was solved by creating uh, a street edge, a street wall along the sidewalk with shops. So that's a comfortable walk. And what that points to is you know, we really need to focus on, in our walkable areas, um, holding the edges of our streets. And then finally, an interesting walk. You know, this is one thing. This is the same spatially. But on the left is, and this is the street that connects the two hotels in Grand Rapids, the two best hotels. On the left is a parking garage, and on the right is actually a hotel that was designed, apparently inspired by the parking garage. Um, but, but you know, we need to be interested, and and uh, you know, humans are among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other, other humans, and so we've learned in places like Charleston that it only takes 25 feet of building to hide 250 feet of garage, and there are these these rules that cities are now instituting that you can't expose the edge of a garage to the street. Because as nice as it looks, and you've got some nice looking garages downtown, um, it's boring if there aren't people in it. Uh, or what I call the Chia Pet Garage in Miami <laughs> Beach, um, where they've preserved the Art Deco storefronts and pushed it back uh, from the edge of the street. And that's, that's the theory. So in your city, and in, particularly in your downtown or in your sub centers, where you have an opportunity to bring people together in a walkable realm, um, the question is how you accomplish that. And the work I've been doing recently in a number of cities, most recently in Lowell, Massachusetts, and by the way, the historic, a historic nickname for your city was the Lowell of the South, but I was in the Lowell of the North, um, and the first rule, as you, might, as you might imagine, is fix your streets. So take streets that look like this, one-way, fat lanes, all the same direction, and turn them into two-way, road diet, bike lane streets that, that ultimately are handling the same amount of traffic on a, on a downtown wide basis, and we're doing that. And then this concept of practicing urban triage, and this is the last point I want to share with you, that um, pick your winners and reinforce success. A lot of your city will not be walkable, and that's okay. The most walkable cities in America have huge areas that are principally automotive, but you need to figure out where your walkable areas are and make them more so. And most city planners, most city managers, most mayors feel an obligation to sprinkle the fairy dust evenly around their whole city because it's, you know, you are all my constituents, right? I need to serve all of you. But the fact is that spending money for an improved sidewalk or tree plantings in a strip with four lanes of road, no parking, and lube joints is not going to turn it into a walkable neighborhood. And you need to spend your money on walkability where walkability is possible. And that's what urban triage is about. Here in Davenport, Iowa, this is a map of ignoring the characteristics of the street where do I feel comfortable and interested? And where do I not feel comfortable and interested based on the properties that line the road? From green being an A to you know, red being an F. And from that observation, a pattern emerges of the areas which in green can be walkable very soon, and the areas which in yellow can be walkable before too long. And the areas in white, we're not going to invest a penny in making them more walkable. And we're going to spend the money then, see the correlation between the two diagrams, we're going to spend the money now. Here are a series of interventions, red is short term and gray is long term, that are proposed now on private property in combination with the street improvements to turn uh, 
the unwalkable parts of the downtown into more walkable area. And, and like any planner, when you put lines on a map, you're not dumb enough to be saying, build this now. But what you're saying is, I'm a planner. I'm looking out into the future, because if you don't look into the future, you can't plan. Say, so when you build something, this is where it should go. And as a city, and as a community, as a business community, and even the nonprofits in the community need to understand collectively, this is where we want to see uh, things happen first, and we're going to incentivize it as we can. So I've reached the end of my talk. Um, you know, we do ha have hope that these things, we've, we've seen a tremendous amount of change since the new urbanist movement began, really in earnest around 1980. Um, it has gone from an unknown movement to the dominant movement in the discourse about city planning. In about 20 years, that happened. Um, and we look to the, you know, to the environmentalists and Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring in, in 1962, and how when Silent Spring was written, um, our environment was not protected. And within about a decade, uh, it was perhaps, some would say, overprotected the amount of of laws that were created and activities that were created to save the environment in a mere decade were, were tremendous, dramatic, and effective. So we feel this, let's move it up the food chain a little bit and think about the human environment and what sort of, you know, we know what makes the, 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 the plants and the animals thrive, but what makes the humans thrive? And I think we've, we've come to understand that it's the traditional neighborhood and it's this environment which we need to invest in now um, while, still, while still preserving the environment. And in fact, this will help to preserve the environment. But we've learned now for the humans to be happy, uh, what makes that happen? And we know how to do it. Um, and as Winston Churchill said, um, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted the alternatives. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. I am Virginia Peebles, and I too would like to thank you for coming this morning, and especially of our partnership with Midtown Inc. in this endeavor. And Jeff, you certainly gave us thought-provoking and eight planning ways for the city to move and how wonderful it would be to have a utopian society where all of our communities were walkable. But we certainly have new ideas and great thoughts. And with humor, I can see how you advise mayors and governors and we're most appreciative of you coming to Columbus. Thank you.